It was the fulfillment of a dream to leave Britain and begin a new life on the beautiful Kenyan coast. As soon as I stepped off the plane, I knew, my God, this is the place I want to be. Nikki Roberts dreamt of running her own nightclub in paradise. But her dream became a nightmare when she came face to face with a side of Africa tourists never see. It's in our heritage. It's something you grow up in Africa knowing that, hey, there is black magic and it's dangerous. And when bribery and corruption left her penniless, she faced the agony and humiliation of a brutal Kenyan prison. I hadn't done anything. I was completely innocent. I ever went to Kenya was with Robin, who was my fiance at the time. Robin just saw it as a holiday, a nice place to go. He didn't actually sort of get sucked into the vibe, the, the feeling of it. Africa has a magic about it. If you're in its grip, you can't help but go back. It's just like a burning need. You have to be there and it just drags you back. And I went again and again and again. I always said that one day that maybe I'd retire there or I'd definitely be there one day. I knew that. But then, back in England, Nikki's life was turned upside down when her fiancé, Robin, was killed in a motorbike accident. I was in complete shock for a while. He was 27 when he died. I mean, you know, a 27-year-old dying just like that, it suddenly wakes you up. You suddenly realise, my God, this is your life. It could be over tomorrow. You know, anything could happen to you. You could be dead. So if you don't live now, you're never going to live. With nothing left to keep Nikki in her hometown of Norwich, it was time to get away and start a new life. In Kenya, the money she received from Robin's life insurance policy would go ten times further. Nikki would have the lifestyle she'd always dreamed of. Nikki returned to her favourite resort, Watamu, on the beautiful Kenyan coast. But this wasn't just for a holiday. She'd brought with her a state-of-the-art sound system. It had always been my dream to own a business out in Africa and specifically a nightclub in Watamu because I could see a niche in the market there. I knew that a, a nightclub there would just boom. So I wanted to go over there and just create the ultimate nightclub and really blow everyone away. I had a lot of background in the hospitality business, so I knew the business inside out. So I had the in innate belief that I could do this, and um, I didn't have any fear about it. But this was Kenya, a country with plenty of red tape. Obtaining a business permit wasn't easy. If Nikki wanted to earn a living from the lucrative tourist industry, she would need help. On all my previous visits to Watamu, in fact, from the very first visit, I met a lady called Dorothy. She was such a laugh. We'd just sit on the beach all day, just gossiping and laughing. She used to also run a massage business on the beach, so often, because I had bad back from working on a computer so long in England, I decided, you know, that'd be great, and she worked on my back for me and got that sorted out. At the same time, I started mentioning about the business permit, and she told me that she knew somebody in Mombasa who might be able to help me, a lawyer, might be able to help me obtain this Class H permit. I felt like, yeah, things are really moving now, you know, things are going my way, I can really make this happen, and I've got Dorothy by my side, I know, you know, I'm getting help. I handed over £1,300 in order to get the permit. I didn't feel alone, I felt like this can really work. One night I was out, I was with some friends in a club called Inferno. At that time, I wasn't looking for love at all. Oh, there's no way I was looking for love, especially after the shock of Robin's death. It started funny. I was in a club and everybody was talking about this gorgeous, amazing looking woman. Um, she's from England and she's outstanding and nobody can get to her. All of a sudden, 
an angel appeared. That is her. That is the woman. That is the woman who's gonna bear me my children. There was nothing to say, just to give her the look, and she was fly. All of a sudden, I see this guy, and he's he's dancing on the dance floor, and he's kind of taking the Mickey out of the the tourists, the way they dance, and really, really sort of OTT. But when they look around, he's sort of standing dead still. So I was laughing so badly. All of a sudden, I give the look, and tick, she's got my attention. He, he was making jokes and being a bit of a clown and everything. And he came over and we started chatting. And, and when we actually spoke to each other, it was like, oh, I just found out he was my soulmate. It was amazing. Once we sort of fell for each other, we were just together. We were inseparable. We were together morning, noon, and night. We, we would go for long moonlight walks on the beach. It's like I fell in love at that point, just straight away. It was wham. In Africa, we say troubles or love does not know how to knock the door. It just hits you right in your face. At that stage, you know, life seemed to be going amazingly well. You know, I couldn't hardly believe it. I was in the place of my dreams. I had, you know, the possibility of the most amazing business. I had the most incredible bloke alive. You know, he was just everything to me. He was my soulmate. I couldn't have asked for more. After Moffat moved in, Nikki quickly found some premises where she could set up her nightclub. She took with her the all-important business permit which Dorothy had recently obtained for her. But when she presented it to the building's owner, she didn't get the reaction she was hoping for. The permit was fake. I felt incredibly hurt because she was like my best friend, you know. She was the only person I felt like a trust over the Moffat and I felt destroyed. It, it really tore me up. I went to the police and they took a report but not much was done about it. I was in a foreign country and money taken and I was just left high and dry. Nikki Roberts had arrived in Kenya with a dream of starting a nightclub. Everything was going according to plan, but then her best friend sold her a fake business permit and made off with £1,300. After this incident, it really hit home to me that there was a lot more to Kenya than I'd actually really realised. Moffat used to keep warning me. He used to say to me actually all the time, you know, be careful because it isn't what you think it is. Not all the smiling faces are hiding good hearts. That's what he, one of his things he used to say. Smiling faces can be hiding black hearts too. I thought to myself, maybe, you know, not everybody's going to be like this, surely. So I tried to sort of be open-minded and look forward to getting things sorted out. That was when I was introduced to a guy called Paul, who um, was an elderly man. They call him an old mazé, that means like an old fella, an old chap. He knew a lot about the system, about paperwork, about documents, about how to get things. He had connections in Nairobi and um, a lot of people said, yeah, yeah, he'll help you, you know, go to go see him. And he assured me that he would get me this work permit and I was horrendously nervous about, you know, giving him money but after what had happened with Dorothy. but he reassured me so much that I decided to to give it a shot. Nikki gave Paul more than two thousand pounds plus her passport which he said would be needed to verify her identity. But he said to me he would definitely need more money than that because you have to bribe and there's so many bribes you have to do. Things just don't come easy like this in in Kenya. Amazingly two weeks he was back with the permit there in his hand and I thought God this guy can be trusted this is this is a guy I can use now I mean he's like you know he can be a, a partner with us really to get you know to get this business up and running but as soon as Nikki's permit materialized something else turned up one day Nikki came home and she asked me Moff did you put something on the gate
And she asked me basically, Moffat, what is this thing? Who can, you know, put blood and, and, and skin and, and all the rubbish in for a joke? Is this a prank like in England? I told her, no, my dear. No, this is no prank. This is a serious thing and it's going to affect us and it's going to beat us big time. I, I reached down to pick it up and Moff immediately, Moffat, he immediately sort of said, no, don't, don't do that. My God, don't touch it, don't touch it. And I go, why? He said, it's juju. I said, what's juju? And he explained it was like voodoo. Somebody had thrown it there to basically give us a curse. Throughout the next few days, more and more of these things arrived, but different kinds of ones. We didn't know who was doing it. We had no idea it was happening in the night, so we'd find it in the morning. And my most anxious thought was, what are they after? Who's doing it and why, really? Not long after these things were found on the doorstep, Paul drove round and was quite excited and he, he sat down and said, you know, there's something you ought to listen to, Nicky. He said, that we, these things are dangerous. They're going to bring you bad luck. They're going to stop your business moving forward. Things aren't going to go your way. If you want to be protected, there's something you have to do. It's in our heritage. It's something you grow up in Africa knowing that, hey, there is black magic and it's dangerous. <laughs> Paul arranged for Nikki and Moffat to take part in a voodoo ceremony to counteract the curses. It was really dark at night. We went through all these trees and we got to this place where there was a clearing. And there was this man, the witch doctor. He was dressed with his headdress on. He was stark naked apart from a loincloth. He had like scars all over his chest, like where he'd been sliced. And Moffat explained to me this was part of a lot of the ceremonies where you protect yourself, you have to be sliced. And I said, no way. She went all ballistic and she said, nobody's going to touch my skin with no blade, no one. The last thing I noticed was this open grave. I thought, my God, what's that for? I was like really starting to panic at this stage. Paul explained Nikki must lie down in the grave if she wanted the curse removed by the voodoo ceremony. I was like, oh, I don't know if I can really go through with this. The whole thing was like something out of a horror movie. She just went into the grave because she had to. Paul had told her that it's a must. It is, we can't do without that. You could imagine what it'd be like to be buried alive, actually, at that point. The witch doctor guy took one of the chickens and started plucking it while it was still alive and then throwing the feathers down over me. Then they got one of the chickens and actually slit its throat over the top of the grave where I was laying. There was this hot blood coming down on, on me and it was landing on me and at that point I really freaked out. She was very shaken, very shocked. There's some things you can teach somebody, but there's some things they have to go through them for them to understand. So she did went through that, and I'm ever so sorry for her. With the curse removed, Nikki could safely get on with her plans, and Paul was with her every step of the way. After the juju ceremony, Paul became a much more important fixture in our life. He was our unofficial driver who would drive us where we needed to go. He was also assisting us with, that, with the search for land, the appropriate land to build our nightclub on. He was great. With Paul sorting out the land deal, Nikki started getting things ready for her dream nightclub. But it was proving to be more expensive than she'd expected. Meanwhile, we'd started to run out of money. So Paul had suggested that we rent out the sound system. The state-of-the-art sound system was an essential part of Nikki's plan. There was nothing like it in Watamu. Paul arranged a demonstration for all the local bar and club owners. A number of people come by. 
some of the people from the Jambo nightclub down the road came by and had a look. By the end of the day, Paul had clinched the deal, renting Nicky's sound system to the local Jambo nightclub. Everything was going amazingly well, so smoothly. We, we really felt positive, me and Moff. We believed, you know, things were going to really pan out well for us. The dream was coming alive now at last. And then there was a phone call and the maid came running with the phone. The police are on the phone, the police are on the phone. It's like, oh my God, what's, what is this? What is it? So I was told on the phone that the owner of Jambo Club was at the police station and he was saying that I'd sold my sound system to him and not delivered the goods. And the policeman on the phone said, you have to come down here now, we have evidence against you. When we got there, Paul was there. And I was like, why, why is he here? And I was quite confused. And the police were saying, what have you done with the money? And they said, we have documents. And they came over with this and tried to thrust it in my hands. I said, take it. And I said, no, 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 you're not gonna get me to touch that. My, my prints are nowhere on that, I can tell you now. They said, we have your signature. I was absolutely amazed at how my signature looked. It did look like my signature. The only person who knew my signature and who had a copy of it was Paul. It also had my passport number on there. And I couldn't believe it. As I read further, I saw that Paul was actually written as the person who'd done the deal. And I said, what's going on, Paul? What, what is going on? He didn't say anything. I started getting very angry at this point. I started screaming, what have you been playing at? This was obviously some kind of scam. How could he be involved in this? He was our friend. So I, was, I started to think, my God, this man, what about all the money I've given him? Scrawling off a IOU whenever I gave him money, sometimes 200 here, 100 there. I just couldn't understand. I mean, this is our friend. With Paul's betrayal sinking in, Nikki was sent home by the police chief to get the sound system, but she had other ideas. She called her neighbour, who'd lived in Kenya for years, and asked for help. She said she would be willing to hide the system, and she said she also had a contact in the police station who she'd be able to find out what was really going on behind the scenes. She made a phone call and said, Nikki, you need to get out of Watamu now. I said, why? She said, they're coming to arrest you, and if you go in, you'll stay in. She said, I've got an idea. I know the Deputy Commissioner of Police in Nairobi. I can give him a call and let him know you're coming and he'll be able to sort it out for you. Give my car here. Go, go. Nairobi was 600 kilometers away. It would take them 12 hours to get there. We had to drive in the middle of the night to Nairobi and it was one hell of a journey. I sat there, gripping the wheel, absolutely terrified. I was half expecting a police car to come screaming up behind me any minute. Paul had completely dashed all our hopes on every front. It looked like every single thing that we had done was fake. All our dreams were basically in the dirt. We had nothing. All we had now was our freedom, so we were running for our lives. Nikki and Moffat arrived in the Kenyan capital. They began putting the pieces together. Paul, Jambo club owner and the head of the police station were all of the same tribe. That might not mean much in England, but in Kenya it's a big deal because somebody of your tribe is like your brother and you'll do anything to help them. And more than likely the whole idea had been to frighten me so much I would have had the sound system over and literally that they would have got the system for peanuts. We realised that that was the lowest point we'd reached so far. Everything was in tatters. We didn't know what to do. We had no land, no money, no job. Things were looking really black. When we entered the office, the, the commissioner sat there behind his desk and I would have thought he'd been quite a scary figure, but he wasn't. He was, he was very friendly. He had a big beaming smile on his face. 
and he welcomed us, he shook our hands and, and told us to sit down. And then he said, what can I do for you, my dear? So we told him the story. We said, you know, exactly what had happened. And he then proceeded to ask us for 7,000 shillings, which in English money at the time was about 70 pound. We, we gave him the money. I said, so what's going to happen? Are we going to be okay? You know, is it going to be sorted? And he, he said, don't you worry, don't you worry. Be at home in Kenya, feel at home. And I said, right, well, I still don't know what's going to happen. Can I go back and not be arrested? Is it safe to go back? And he said, no, no, it's fine. I'll sort it, don't worry. So I thought, well, nothing more I can do about it. And I just had to leave because he wasn't going to say any more. So I left the office and we went to a hotel to sleep. <laughs> When Nicky and Moffat returned to Watamu, they found the commissioner had been true to his word. He'd sacked the local chief of police. And there was some other good news. We discovered that Paul now had a warrant for arrest against him. So he'd gone on the run. At the same time, we started having really strange things happening in our house. It had a really dark sort of quality. We started feeling uneasy. We had lights flickering on and off. We would start to fit, hear sounds outside which we couldn't identify. It might sound crazy, but this really happened. The maid ran. We didn't see her again for days. And Moffat said, there's Juju going on again. We've actually heard through somebody in the village that Paul had actually been behind it, basically getting revenge because there was now a warrant out for his arrest. So we knew that he was deeply embroiled in this kind of stuff and we actually feared. So we decided we had to get away. We then moved to Malindi, which is about 30 kilometers away. And I've discovered I was pregnant at that point. Nikki Roberts' dream wasn't turning out the way she had planned. She'd been hounded out of her house by black magic and conned by the people she'd trusted. Now, with her money almost gone, she was expecting a child. The worst part was not really knowing what was going to happen because I had no mother there, no sister, no friends. Nobody could give me any advice on how it was all going to happen and what pregnancy was all about. And there was no such thing as scans or anything like that going on. There was no hospital, not proper hospital, for about 130 kilometres. The nearest one was Mombasa. So I was literally in a town which didn't really have a proper hospital at all. All of a sudden, my waters broke and I was in the most unbelievable pain. There was no pain relief of any kind. I just had to get on with it. After 24 hours, Nikki and Moffitt realized they needed medical help. A local private clinic was the closest port of call. Nothing was happening. I wasn't dilated. So we phoned the clinic. And they said to me, if this carries on much longer, you're going to have to go to hospital and have a caesarean because you can't go more than 24 hours because the baby could suffer as a result. And they said they needed 500 pounds up front. I didn't have 500 pounds, I was broke. So I was faced with the only alternative. And that was to go to the local hospital where the local people went and off we went. I was comforting her all the time and I know she was going through hell and I told her um, just be brave you know hold on we're gonna give birth and we're gonna get a beautiful kid and she or he's gonna be adorable
When we arrived at this hospital, I was expecting to see a hospital. What I basically saw was a collection of buildings, literally made out of breeze block. And throughout all these buildings were throngs and throngs of local Africans, some really sick, wailing on the floor. It was just chaos. And I just looked at this and thought, my God, I can't be having an operation in a place like this. I was taken to a room where they put a catheter in. The doctor came along, who was a very well-respected surgeon from the area, and I felt quite safe putting myself in his hands because he was known to, to help a lot of the, the white community. So I was put on this metal trolley. It was almost like something you'd wheel food on. And I was wheeled on this metal trolley, which was icy cold through the corridor and straight into an operating theatre. I was then laid out on the operating table where people were actually arranging the knives and sorting the knives and scalpels and everything out right in front of me. This was completely scary. I was panicking. I, I, I didn't know what to do. And the next thing I know, I'm being put under. As Nikki slipped into unconsciousness, what she didn't know was that the surgeon she trusted had gone home, too exhausted to perform another operation. Nikki was now in the hands of inexperienced trainee doctors. I was in catch 22 situation. If I don't let her go in that theater and get operated on, obviously we lose our daughter. And if I let her go in there, I don't know what they're gonna do to her. The next thing I remembered was being dragged up as if from somewhere really deep to the feeling of the most unbelievable pain I have ever felt in my entire life. It was like somebody was ripping my guts out from inside me. It's a burning pain so bad. I actually believed I was dead and in hell. As my mind came more and more conscious, I suddenly realized I was actually on the operating table. I was awake, they were operating on me, and I was paralyzed, and I couldn't tell them. I tried to move my arms, I couldn't move them because the drug they give you to paralyze you was just so strong, you, you can't move a thing. And I laid there, trapped in this body, I couldn't move a thing, and, and I was just feeling everything. I prayed and prayed, and about 30 minutes later, I heard a little voice. Oh. At that point, I started expelling what looked like the placenta. So they hadn't even removed it during the operation. It was just left there. I could that another thing I could have died from. It is lucky they delivered my kid alive. But from there on, it was a disaster to the end. They ripped my wife to bits and I don't think I'll ever forgive those people. Nikki gave birth to a healthy baby girl, Saffron. But her own recovery took some time. It took me a long while before it healed. It took about three months before I was actually able to move normally. I couldn't do anything that was like dancing or running or anything that involved serious activity. I could move around, walk, but that was about the limit of what I could do. The reason I decided not to, to go back to UK at that point was the fact that facing defeat, giving in, I didn't want to go back and people go, you see, we told you so. I didn't want to face that. I was too proud, maybe wrongly, but I, I thought, right, 
I'm going to battle this. I'm going to win this. I'm going to make this happen. I've still got my dream. It can still happen. I'm going to do it. After some months had passed, I actually heard the very nightclub me and Moffat had met in, Inferno Nightclub, had been empty for a year and was actually up for renting. So I thought, wow, this is my opportunity again, you know? Maybe I can get in there and, and you know, my dream can still happen. I went and saw the landlady and had a long discussion with her. She seemed very keen on the idea and I was very surprised when she didn't actually require much in the way of money to get the place. She made an agreement with me that I could offset the, the cost of me doing the place against the rent. I basically got the roof repaired, painted it, did basically most of the superficial stuff and we were open in time for Christmas. And the place became a massive hit. Everything was brilliant. You know, this is what I lived for. This is what I wanted. My little girl was being cared for by her own personal maid. Not ideal, but I had to make a living. Everything looked to be going fantastically. But then um, we started having problems. So the abracadabra start again. The juju hit again. It was just madness. The Iskari, the watchman, at night started to refuse to work. He said there's weird things going on in the garden. He said there's creatures roaming this garden that aren't of this earth. Previously, we'd been packed full of people. Now, they were coming up to the door. They would actually put one foot over the threshold, would turn and walk away. And we couldn't make out what was going on. The black magic heat has hurt with hatred, with such hatred and jealousy and envy. How can this British girl and this kissy boy, they come to our land, they earn what we could earn in a year in one night? That is hard to take for a Kenyan. We, we, we keep running out of supplies all the time, so again, the customers were getting annoyed because they couldn't get this drink or that drink. Many a time I would, I would call the beer company and sort of say, you know, what's going on with my beer? And I would not really get a reply. They would promise they would deliver it and it would never come. There was one particular time I was literally screaming down the phone, where's my beer? Where's my beer? Because my customers didn't have anything to drink. The next minute. I'm being dragged out of my house by police officers with guns at their sides. I was completely in shock. Now what have I done to deserve this, you know? She was arrested, manhandled, being shoved by a gun in the back like as if she's a criminal. She's asking them, what's wrong, what's going on? Do you know what they tell her? Uh oh, we are not allowed to talk to you. Only the judge can talk to you. From there, I was dragged into the chambers where the magistrate was. She didn't see me in court. I was dragged into chambers. Miss Robert, you have committed a serious crime. And I was given a paper saying, you're being accused of an electricity bill which you haven't paid. You've broken some furniture in, an, in the nightclub and the landlady's got a complaint against you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't know anything about this. This is rubbish. And anyway, I set up the electricity bill in my name. It's nothing to do with the landlady. It's between me and the electricity people. They said, no, 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 the bill is this much and you have to pay money. I said, but I don't have any money. And the magistrate said, if you don't pay 300,000 shillings right now, which was about 3,000 pounds, you're going in. And by going in, that means going in prison. I said, where am I going to get that money from? She said, OK, that's me for the day. She can go in. She got up, picked up her bag, walked out the door. And that was it. There was nobody else to protest to because she was the only body who could not, who could, who could undo the order. 
I was dragged from that office, crying, screaming. I saw Moffat down there and I, I was screaming at him, help me, help me, do something about it, quickly, do something, I don't want to go to prison. She's coming outside, being pushed all over the place by the back of the gun. I'm trying to comfort her, telling her, be sure that I'm going to come. I'm, I'm going to be there for whatever it takes, I'll, I'll make sure I'll protect her. Deep inside, I knew no matter what, for that night at least, I was going to prison. There was nothing they could do because the, the magistrate had gone home. I was thrown on the back of this truck with all of those women from the holding cells on this big open back truck where everybody could see you. So, we drove off. We were bumped in this truck throughout the whole of Malindi. There were people watching from the side of the streets. Of course, they're going to stare at a white person in the back of a prison lorry. I was an oddity. I felt, I felt like that small. It was humiliating. It's almost like how the mighty have fallen because one minute I'm like this nightclub owner and I've, you know, living my dream. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm a blooming criminal. And that's how I felt. I felt shame as if I really was a criminal, even though I'd done nothing wrong. I was shoved into this small room with two prison officers and two prisoners and I was told strip naked people were obviously staring at me being again white person I was an object of curiosity I was extremely ashamed and embarrassed because I still had this big angry mess of a stomach big red scar basically I was told bend over we're gonna strip search you and they did an internal search and um, it was painful and it was embarrassing and I've never had anything like that done to me before and I felt, oh, I don't know, I felt like dirt. This is a woman who's never seen this kind of treatment in her life. And she's not even healed up properly. And, and, they're, and they're laughing, saying, oh, you think this is Europe where you come here, you're given your PlayStation in jail? This is not jail, this is Rumand, and you better get used to it, or else we're going to make you black even if you're white. I was put into a cell with, must be about 20 other women in there. I was basically told to sleep on the floor. So I sat in a corner and cried and wondered what I'd done that was so bad. The prison was steaming hot. There were mosquitoes everywhere. I'd already had malaria five times throughout my time of living in Kenya and I could see it happening again very easily. Conditions in the prison were horrendous. They were unbelievable, really. People had TB. They had HIV. One of the worst things that happened has got to be when they make you cover. Cover means, in Swahili, it means you have to crouch down on your, on your toes with your hands behind your head and balance there. This is normally when they do a head count. 
I didn't know the word cover. So when they said it the first time, I didn't crouch down. I didn't know what it meant. So I was beaten with a stick. When I got down, obviously in pain, I couldn't balance. I just kept tipping over and falling down. And every time I did that, I'd be hit with a stick. When I heard that I wanted to climb that fence and eat somebody, I wanted to eat somebody, but there was nothing I could do. These guys, they have AKs. They were protected. They were the law. Day after day went by and I had no idea if I was going to get out or how I was going to get out. I thought that was it. What Nicky didn't realize was that the lawyer that Moffitt had hired had already done everything he could to secure her release. And even though he'd paid the full bond, the magistrate had other ideas. I found out afterwards that the magistrate refused to sign the release papers. Nobody knew why, but she just made sure I stayed in. After 10 days in prison, the magistrate finally released Nikki. Oh, you should have seen me. I was all over the place. I was over the moon because of the relief to just see her, just to know my daughter's gonna get her mother back. Nikki left the prison confused as to why she'd been sent there in the first place, but she soon found out. After I started to feel a bit better, I, I sort of inquired about the club. I found out that everything I'd left in the club had been taken out, the locks had been changed. And worst of all, I found out that the magistrate who'd put me in prison was now running the club. The landlady had got in a stupid white person who'd been naive, who'd spent her money there, who'd done the place up, got in really good business, made the place really pumping and then decided to snatch it back. Nikki Roberts had gone to Kenya in pursuit of her dream. That dream was now in tatters. The thing with Kenya is the majority believe that if you're white, you must have gold in your pockets. It's just a misconception that if, you, if you're white, you must have money. And therefore, they're poor. Why shouldn't they have some of your money? In 2003, Nikki and Moffitt got married in Kenya before deciding to return to the UK. Their marriage didn't last and Moffitt returned to Africa. He couldn't handle the lifestyle, he couldn't handle the fast pace of life because UK doesn't have the same relaxed atmosphere as Kenya. People are a lot colder, they don't stop and greet you in the street and he found that very soul destroying. The only thing I can really say that's been positive as far as what's come out with me, is my daughter. She's um, the best thing that came out of my relationship with Moffat, and she's, you know, a good memory of Kenya. So, as far as that's concerned, um, I'm, I'm happy. I'm really happy. The future is this. We will be together. We will still love each other till the day we die, because Nicola and Roberts is my best friend. There's a possibility we might get back together if we can put the past behind us. Now I'm well again, I feel strong enough to be able to deal with that. So who knows what the future can bring.